We are bringing you Block Digest episode 246 at block height 659,260 on Sunday, November 29th. What is up, Janine? Well, yesterday was a very important day because it was the uh, uh, 10th anniversary of Cablegate. Where's your what's here? What's, what's, is, what's that? Is that, is that the, the WikiLeaks thing? They, could they call it the bad, bad government? Yes. yes uh, <laughs> discount Elmo. <laughs> um, <laughs> How dare you? Um, yes, uh, it was the 10th anniversary of WikiLeaks starting to <laughs> release the U.S. diplomatic cables. Ah, that was a very chaotic time. It was indeed. Think of it, they weren't even accepting Bitcoin yet. Yeah, I never even realized that was so close to Thanksgiving. Mm Mm-hmm. And then in uh, December 7th, uh, what, December 7th-ish is around the time when the banking blockade started uh, and is also, according to Zella, uh, kind of the anniversary of Assange losing his freedom in terms of uh, being, you know, arrested and put under house arrest for two years and then going into the embassy and now being in Belmarsh. That's where it all started. At least Bitcoin was there for WikiLeaks. I mean, that that whole period could easily have been the end of WikiLeaks themselves and not just Julian getting stuck in that pile of shit. Yeah, I believe they started accepting Bitcoin in June or July of 2011, so they waited a bit, but that was when they were having discussions about it on the the Bitcoin talk wiki or the forum. Um, I think it was Amir Taki who actually uh, suggested it, and then Satoshi uh, disappeared shortly thereafter. <laughs> you do anything for Turkey Day? Um. Well ate turkey and watched Adam's Family Values, where, of course, uh, Wednesday burns down their play village. (laughs) Did you violate any stupid restrictions for holidays that fascists implemented? Um, Not that I am aware of, but you never know. I did. Twice. Suck it, police state. Yeah, I believe there is an alternative version of the don't tread on me flag going around uh, instead of with a turkey and a star and it says, take it or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to get that flag and I'm going to fly it because fuck the police state. If I want to eat turkey with my family, I'm going to eat fucking turkey with my family. I do find it slightly amusing that the person to get a pardon on Thanksgiving was a guy who has the word fly in his last name, considering that the turkey is a flightless bird. That's just where my brain goes. I just think that it's silly that politicians still do things like that that are ultimately just for kids to be like, ooh, the turkey got saved. And not think about the millions and millions of turkeys that didn't. Well, I mean, I've never looked into it, but I'd kind of like to know what actually happens to the turkey besides it not being eaten. Because if you know anything about Groundhog Day, for example, um, the groundhog is generally just a fat bastard who sits around in a cage for most of his life. 
I just I just think it's the silly thing catering to kids like that, like how Fauci um, made a public announcement that Santa is immune to COVID so that kids don't freak out when their parents put presents under the tree anyway. <laughs> no, Santa is definitely not immune. I mean, first of all, he's overweight. He has a really poor diet. He lives in the North Pole, which means <laughs> there's <laughs> there's there's no vitamin D getting into that skin. And then, you know, he's a... Uh, He's around, who knows whether reindeer are one of the uh, animals like the minks in Denmark who uh, can get uh, coronavirus too and possibly transmit it to humans and then get murdered uh, in the millions and then raised, <laughs> get raised from the grave because of gas, apparently. Uh, also, he has a red nose, so if he went through any kind of like border check, he would instantly get like flagged for, you know... Just saying. <laughs> so what you're saying is that Fauci lied to everybody in America, and he's trying to get them to accept the super spreader into their home. Exactly. And also, he's going to go down a chimney. Um, dirty. So, yeah. Um, Santa is going to be the ultimate coronavirus super spreader. That's exactly right. <laughs> This very well might get us banned from YouTube, but it has to be said. Santa Claus is part of the Illuminati's depopulation conspiracy. I mean, think about it. Also, he's going to be supposedly drinking milk and eating cookies from, uh, from you know, uh, plates and things that have been touched by other people. So there's multiple ways that he can get this thing. We have to cancel Christmas for the good of the human race. We have to use a uh, UVC light on all the presents that he leaves behind. <laughs> I, I, I feel like we could go on uh, doing this for the next hour, but <laughs> on a, no, on uh, a, on a weird note, um, any kids who are on his naughty list might actually be safe because if all they get is coal, well, they're not going to want to touch that. But the kids who get the presents, uh, who knows what they're spreading social engineering at its finest ah, but yeah i don't want to dive into the first story which is a another instance of uh humoring the children the fud spreader yeah different kind of virus so i think it was like three or four maybe 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 six months ago or something like that um there, there was some anonymous criticism of Taproot um, posted to the mailing list uh, that I speculate was uh, Mark Friedenbach and potentially some other um, butthurt uh, Bitcoin core devs or former devs. And um, yeah, it was pretty much a bunch of incoherent nonsense arguments. Well, um, Mr. Nikita... Uh, Zavoranikov, I don't, I don't even care if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, some idiot who shills Ethereum and Bcash and um, is the lead developer of Blockchair, a, uh, a big block shitcoin um, block explorer that also does some chain analytics um, data analysis, published a gigantic, massive 35 tweet thread on how Taproot is an attack and a, a negative impact on Bitcoin's privacy because it creates a new address format that's separate from all the existing address formats, thereby making you stand out more. Um, and just going on a huge rant, um, spelling out, duh, Captain Obvious level shit. Like if two outputs in a transaction have different address types, that reveals things. If you're using a different address type than another UTXO, there is a fingerprint to distinguish those two UTXOs. And reading about how this is an evil thing and bad for Bitcoin privacy, well, then I guess so was pay to script hash, so was segwit, so was pay to public key hash because everything used to just have raw public keys. Um, pretty much every feature increase, um, time locks, hash locks, 
all of these things that are not just raw public keys have been secretly destroying Bitcoin's privacy without us realizing it. And it's just like, oh my God. Like I, I thought we were past the point where these shit coiners would pathetically attempt to just FUD narratives like this as we try to improve this system. Like you forked off. You you have your little shit coin where you can go do things like an idiot. Go do that. And it's just so absurd. This kind of shit with Taproot um, being pointed out as a problem when Taproot comes with so much privacy improvements, like the ability to bury script conditions, to not have things like hash locks or time locks visible on chain unless a non-cooperative use case happens, like the ability to have a multi-sig address that looks like a single sig address and is indistinguishable, like all of these massive improvements that will just compound more and more the more people upgrade to Taproot. It's it's absurd. It's it's like seriously shit coiner, fuck off and go play with your shit coin now. Bye bye. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I do find it kind of funny that his uh, the end of his presentation is like, why are you talking about this and why is no one else talking about this? And he basically says, Blockstream, Core, they want to kill Bitcoin or something or whatever that old conspiracy theory is. And then he says, I don't have any conflicts of interest. And it's like, okay, buddy. Um, but uh, I would like to say, you know, this argument um, of like, you know, having more than one address type being a problem that it somehow distinguishes you um, by that argument, um, Zcash, I mean, I don't know what his opinion on Zcash is, but by that argument, um, Zcash, I mean, that's absolute crap because not only does it have, you know, the so-called shielded addresses and then the unshielded addresses, which are basically just normal Bitcoin addresses. Um, shielded address adoption is like really, really low. It's still, I think it's still 5% or less. Um, last I checked. So so if, if he thinks SegWit adoption is bad at around 50% of transactions, um, then, you know, Zcash is complete trash because they... I don't even think the the number, I mean, the number of, can't remember exactly when I last checked, but when they really started measuring it, I think there was two studies, one in 2018 and one more recently, and it was like less than 1% of transactions were using shielded addresses, shielded coins. So, I mean, if Zcash is allowed to continue doing its business and getting lots of praise and money, um, I don't really see what the problem is <laughs> here. Yeah, and it's like the rationale with the Bitcoin core bullshit. It's like, what What do you mean? Like, what, here, what, what is the exact quote? Bitcoin core developers, parentheses, and associated for-profit companies like Blockstream, Chaincode Labs, etc. need Taproot for their new products. A clear conflict. Um, Bitcoin core doesn't make products. They release an open client. Um, Chaincode Labs is not a for-profit company. And um, Blockstream products like Liquid that's already live right now has absolutely no need for taproot whatsoever um like what <laughs> what, what the hell are you saying here because it doesn't make any sense coherently yeah and also saying like oh these groups of people need something for their products to work it's like okay but um yeah like is are their products bad? Like, are their products contrary to what Taproot is supposed to be for? Like, what, what is the, what is the rub there? Like, oh, X wants something. Okay, what, what is the problem with X wanting something? Like, is it 
I don't I don't see the problem. Are they like gatekeeping its use only for their product or something? I don't really get what the criticism is with that. Yeah, and it's like there there are so many huge wins here. Like just looking at Schnorr and Musig. Like one of the big problems I have with everybody pushing everybody else to use multisig lately is one keeping all of the public keys and how important that is to not lose coins and two all of the people shilling multisig like who out there is explaining that all of your inputs are going to be bigger more expensive to spend you're going to pay more in fees all of those those size differences and fee difference problems disappear with musig one input one signature just like a single SIG address, it is no longer disproportionately expensive for people to benefit from more distributed security like that. So, and it looks like a normal single SIG address. So like, I have no clue what the hell Nikita is smoking over there, but I just see nothing but winning <laughs> in every direction with Taproot and Schnorr. Just go away, shitcoiner. Go away. Go play with your shitcoin. So yeah, this is going to be really fun to see. Alrighty, are we ready for a cool autistic shinobi dump? You will have to explain to me what is autistic about it. Math! But, um, so last week, uh, SuredBits tested on mainnet a multi-nonce setup for a discrete log contract. And pretty much how this would work, um naively is let's say you and i make a bet about the price of bitcoin um for every single individual price um the oracle needs a different nonce to sign off on that when the time comes to close the contract and so if we're going to denominate this let's say just in dollars there's no smaller um denomination than a dollar that's literally for every single dollar between both bounds of the price up and down has to have its own nonce, its own pre-signed transaction, its own way to settle the contract. And that requires a lot of transactions. So pretty much what SuredBits um, did here is in all of the pre-signed transactions to close the contract, um, they're using adapter signatures so that um, what's revealed when the Oracle signs something um, allows you to you know, plug that into the signature, make it valid, and submit the transaction. So the trick here <clears throat> is decomposing the digits of all of those price ranges so that rather than signing the entire price, the Oracle would individually sign with a separate nonce each digit in that price in a, a specific place. Um, and pretty much what you can do here is make a lot of shortcuts. And the idea is that rather than having a single signature on things, you have each individual digit and any relevant digit for a price closure, <clears throat> you can pretty much take those values and smush them all together into a single value. And then that is the value that the appropriate um, contract execution transaction had their signature adapted by. And you can do kind of neat things like this. Like let's say um, anything under 10,000, um, like that's the cutoff point. Um, any price below that, you win everything in the contract, Janine. Well, rather than having to have a separate transaction for every single price that could potentially um, happen under 10,000, we just make a single pre-signed transaction that just uses the signature on the 10,000th um, digit place. And if that's zero and signed, that is the only nonce that's connected to um, the contract execution transaction that would give you everything um, at any price under 10000 And rather than having to have each individual dollar price with its own pre-signed transaction, 
we just have the one transaction that says you win everything. And if that appropriate digit is signed with a zero, rather than smushing um, those values together to get an additive nonce, um, you just use that single one, adapt the signature and close things. So <clears throat> it's, it's a lot more efficient in the sense that the outer bounds of contracts, um, you just need one transaction on each outer bounds to finalize things appropriately rather than have to have a whole set of transactions pushing way outside the bounds of the contract just to make sure that people can settle it correctly. And so th this is a, a real huge push forward for DLCs and definitely something that is going to make them a lot easier to deal with because participants are going to have to sign a lot less transactions than they would doing this the naive way, just signing off on an entire price value. Cool. So, so once again, Nadav, Chris, Ben, everybody at Sherdbits, you guys are kicking fucking ass. So is it time for Coinbase hour? Yes, it is. gonna be a long stretch of show i think yeah so if any of you have listened to this show for any length of time you know that we're not big fans of coinbase on my end in particular uh after they acquired former hacking team upper management last year and only changed that two weeks after people freaked the fuck out about it um yeah i don't think i'm ever gonna change that position but uh uh, well, the title of this segment was written as uh, Brian Armstrong Do Good, question mark. And I would like to note that um, Shinobi wrote this because I view the following thread from Brian Armstrong that I'm about to read as less of a Brian Do Good moment and more of a oh shit, look at the monster we've created moment. Because hey, hey, any. Hey. I put a question mark. I see. I uh, want that there for the record. I see. Well, anyone who's been following Coinbase knows that when it comes to embracing financial regulation and surveillance, they are high up there on the ass-kissing scale, and so it should be no surprise to them that some anti-privacy policy decisions may be on the horizon, uh, or at least according to rumors, uh, because on November 25th, he tweeted out a very long thread about how he had heard rumors that the U.S. Treasury and Secretary Mnuchin were planning to rush out some new regulation regarding self-hosted crypto wallets before the end of the uh, end of his term. I would like to note that um, I, if I remember correctly, when Brian Brooks, the former legal counsel, uh, chief legal officer of Coinbase, uh, became the new head of the uh, OCC, I believe. Um, I remember him being congratulated by Secretary Mnuchin, and I remember Brian Armstrong uh, quote tweeting Mnuchin congratulating <laughs> Brian Brooks. Uh, so awkward. Um, anyway, his thread says, I'm concerned that this would have uh, unintended consequences, and I want to share those concerns. Uh, skip, skip, skip one second. All right. He says, this proposed regulation, which she will describe shortly, is, uh, um, we think, would require financial institutions like Coinbase to verify the recipient slash owner of the self-hosted wallet collecting identifying information on that party before a withdrawal could be sent to that self-hosted wallet. And I would just like to note here that this... Sounds very similar to the stuff that is happening in the Netherlands that I believe we talked about in the last episode, uh, where supposedly the central bank is kind of enforcing some kind of KYCC policy um, onto uh, at least exchanges or custodians in the Netherlands. Um, so it looks like that's also potentially coming to the U.S. or at least some kind of regulation that forces uh, exchanges to do that, but who knows. Um, but he says, this sounds like a reasonable idea on the surface, but it is a bad idea in practice because it is often impractical to collect identifying information on a recipient in the crypto economy. Let me explain why. Many crypto users are sending crypto to smart contracts using DeFi apps. Actually, I don't think very many are doing that, but okay. 
A smart contract is not necessarily owned by an individual or business who could be identified as a new type of recipient that doesn't have any direct equivalent in finan uh, traditional financial services. Many crypto users are sending crypto to various merchants online, paying for goods and services. Does it make sense to require customers to help verify the identity of a business before they can buy a product there? Many crypto users are also sending crypto to people in emerging markets where it is difficult uh, or impossible to collect meaningful know your customer information. Some of these individuals are living in poverty and may not have any permanent address or form of good ID. Yes, Brian, um, I should like to note this. Obviously not possible to use Coinbase without these things, and he has done absolutely nothing to help them in that regard. Um, because even as a documented person myself, I don't have the right form of ID to use Coinbase. Uh, so I don't even have a Coinbase account, even if I wanted one. Uh, so this whole open financial system marketing is just empty. Anyway, continued. Uh, he says, many crypto users are using their crypto with new types of applications online. Imagine if every time you wanted to upvote some content on Reddit or transfer an item in a game, you were hit with a form asking you to verify your recipient. Finally, many recipients in the U.S. or abroad who value their financial privacy may simply not want to upload more identifying documents to various companies, which could be hacked or stolen. Indeed. Hello, that is me. Um... This additional friction would kill many of the emerging use cases for crypto. Crypto is not just money, it is digitizing every type of asset. Given these barriers, we're likely to see fewer transactions from crypto financial institutions to self-hosted wallets. This would effectively create a walled garden for crypto financial services in the US, cutting us off from innovation happening in the rest of the world. This would be bad for America because it would force U.S. customers to use foreign regulated crypto companies to get access to these services. Long term, I believe this would put America's status as a financial hub at risk. Just like the U.S. benefited enormously by embracing the open Internet, uh, it should embrace the open crypto networks and allow U.S. citizens to move their money freely in the emerging crypto economy. Haha, <laughs> wait, Brian thinks that U.S. customers have financial freedom? Uh, since when? <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't quite remember that. But as far as I know, if you're an American, even if you don't even live in the U.S. or have any business in the U.S., you're required to report all of your income and anything you do to the IRS and pay some form. Well, under some circumstances, still pay taxes to the IRS, even if you don't live in the U.S. Uh, and anytime you go to a bank, it is highly relevant for that bank to find out whether you're an American because uh, they have a bunch more compliance requirements for people like you. So I don't know what you're talking about financial freedom here. Uh, anyway, if this crypto regulation comes out, it would be a terrible legacy and have long standing negative impacts for the US. In the early days of the internet, there were people who called for it to be regulated like the phone companies. Thank goodness they didn't. We sent a letter to the Treasury last week along with a number of other crypto companies and investors articulating these concerns and others. Okay. It would be cool if they, you know, shared that letter as, you know, kind of Coin Center has been sharing the letters that they send, but uh, who knows? Yeah. I'm honestly not sure at this point whether to really believe that Mnuchin and the treasury and OCC are really considering stuff like this or whether this was kind of just a look over here kind of thing. Um, if you catch my meaning. Yes. But wouldn't it be absolutely hilarious that, you know, they tried this whole uh, revolving door thing where they sent in one of their guys to be the head of the OCC and he got congratulated by Steve Mnuchin and then they turn on him. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, I, I definitely laugh if that happened, but I just, I find it kind of hard to reconcile something like that with all the other stuff the OCC has been doing. I mean, like, I, they could absolutely try something like that. Um, like they're doing it in other countries, like the, the Netherlands, uh, you covered last time, um, in the last episode, but like I, I just don't see that happening because that would be fought so fast in court. I mean, that's even the almost instant response in the Netherlands. And there is so much more of a, a basis to be like, what the hell? 
like, you know, that's my property. Why can I not receive my property and control it without jumping through all these arbitrary hoops? Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't want to be naive, but I find it unlikely, especially in the climate of things where there's so much else to be concerned about that uh, the U.S. government would be able to make that kind of policy because you have the whole, you know, kind of free speech and code is law intermingling where you're you're basically banning people from being able to receive numbers on their devices. Uh, I don't know how well that's going to go over. Mm hmm. Like I, I, I could see it being tried, but I just, yeah, until I see something directly from the treasury or the comptroller, I mean, I just see Brian trying to distract from um, the accusations of a racist workplace. Like, if they try anything in that regard, it's going to be similar to this whole, like, attempt to ban uh, encryption or use golden key, so-called golden key encryption, where they're really like, well, if you want to use an unhosted let that's fine, but you have to give us a copy. It's going to be something like that. That's what I would expect. Not, uh, not you are not allowed to even use um, self-hosted wallets. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I guess we will see how things go. I mean, if there's any merit to this, there's going to be an OCC or Treasury announcement eventually. So so what else is Coinbase doing? And why, why does everybody seem to be obsessed with taking away this freedom from people? Well, interestingly, in the same month, this month, that uh, HODL HODL officially opened their new peer-to-peer -peer lending platform to the U.S. market, Coinbase uh, announced last week that they would be disabling their margin trading product response to new guidance from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, I say customers currently using margin trading will not be able to place new margin trades starting 2 p.m. PT, I assume Pacific time, on November 25th. For customers using credit, all open limit orders will be canceled at this time. The product will be taken offline in December once all existing margin positions have expired. We believe clear, common sense regulations for margin lending products are needed to protect and provide peace of mind to U.S. customers. We look forward to working closely with regulators to achieve this goal. That's my army man voice, <laughs> I guess. Uh, while they do not, uh, yeah, they don't cite um, the guidance specifically that they're referring to anywhere, but I'm assuming they're talking about how. CFTC said that they should register as a commodities exchange if they are going to offer margin trading products because I think they disabled margin trading before um, related to that in 2017 and then they re-enabled it uh, for whatever reason. Um, so apparently they have not decided to register as a commodities, commodities exchange. Uh, so I guess they're just going to shut down margin trading. And I'm not a trader and I'm not on Coinbase, so I don't really care. Because uh, it sounds like even the people who are on Coinbase uh, are barely able to trade on days where it matters because uh, Coinbase doesn't function very well. <laughs> it is a Bitcoiner's Satoshi given right to buy Bitcoin with Bitcoin slash gamble like a degenerate fuck you brian okay do we want to move along to the uh consequences of uh degenerate trading oh my god this would yeah this one was such a big fuck up on coinbase's part yeah so last week it was reported by the tax software provider crypto trader dot tax great domain um that dozens of individuals had received notices from the IRS warning them that they had underreported their crypto asset activities. And it turns out that this was not the case because according to CryptoTrader, these CP2000 cryptocurrency related tax mishaps all stem from the fact that Coinbase and other exchanges use form uh, 1099k to report crypto proceeds to the IRS. This is a problem and we dive further into it below, and which I will read because it is very interesting. 
All right. So they say CP2000 is a notice that automatically gets sent out when the IRS receives information about income that did not get reported on your tax return. These notices often get triggered from the 1099 reporting system. You're likely generally familiar with how the 1099 information works. There are exactly 20 different types of 1099s in existence today. 1099B, 1099K, 1099DIV, etc. And each of them serve the same general purpose, providing information to the Internal Revenue Service about certain types of income from non-employment related sources. If you forget to file income from one of your 1099s, you're likely to receive a CP2000 notice from the IRS. For example, if you drove for Uber all year but didn't report any of your Uber earnings on your taxes, you would likely receive a CP2000. This is because Uber is required to send both you, the Uber driver, and the IRS a copy of your 1099, which details your Uber earnings from the year. If the IRS detects that your tax return did not include the income you received from driving for Uber, it will trigger trigger a CP2000 notice. The gross amount of the reportable payment on your 1099-K does not represent any gains or losses you need to report to the IRS. It solely reports the gross proceeds from all transactions you've made on the network, in this case Coinbase. This is the problem with this form. Instead of reporting gains and losses, which are the real numbers you need for tax reporting, 1099-K sums up all of your trades and sells uh, that happened within your Coinbase account and reports that number to the IRS. This makes it look like you had huge amounts of unreported income on your tax return. 1099-K was never meant to be a form for cryptocurrency exchanges to use to report income. It was designed to report earnings from platforms where you were being paid directly by third-party merchants like Uber, Lyft, and Etsy. This form does not make sense in the context of cryptocurrency exchanges, and yet many prominent exchanges like Coinbase have decided it is the 1099 that they are going to use to report customer earnings information. Yeah. Yeah, that is such a next-level fuck up like so hardcore like the 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 1099k that's what payment processors are supposed to file when you are using them to receive money as a business and like you said the b is like capital gains and capital losses like i i i cannot even begin to comprehend how incompetent the person in charge of this finance shit at Coinbase is to have made that fuck up. Like that, that's literally like you just buy Bitcoin um, from like what I can tell with how they did this. Um, you buying Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is now income as if you just earned that running a business or like, that, like how the fuck do you fuck that up so hard? How do you fuck that up? Yeah, but there's more. Um, First of all, I would like to take a moment to point out how bizarrely bad Coindesk is at writing basic sentences because the intro paragraph for the article that gives an update on this situation has a typo, uh, a comma where a period shouldn't be, or should be, and then uh, they write, a Coinbase spokesperson simply sent Coindesk a link to the post, and for the part where it says a link... In that sentence, there's a pop-out tag that shows the market price change of the chain link token. Like, what the hell? Like, seriously? <laughs> so bad. Anyway, um, the Coinbase blog post uh, uh, more recently says that for the 2028 U.S. tax season, Coinbase will only issue the IRS form 1099 miscellaneous, M-I-S-C, Uh, For eligible Coinbase.com, Coinbase Pro, and Coinbase Prime customers, non-U.S. customers will not receive any forms from Coinbase and must utilize their transaction history to fulfill their local tax obligation. And in the Coindesk article, it says if if the 1099 miscellaneous uh, became standard for traders, a lot more people are going to get it because the threshold for getting a 1099 miscellaneous is very low. I believe that's Shinobi. Do you know actually if it stands for miscellaneous? That's what I'm assuming it stands for, but I yeah. don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Shehan Chandrasekhira, head of strategy at Coin Tracker. Um, so this is more from the Coindex article. It's apparently a portfolio monitoring service. Um, 
It says, whereas a 1099K is strictly for payees receiving more than 200 transactions a year worth over $20,000, the 1099 miscellaneous would capture everyone getting $600 and up. While switching to the 1099 miscellaneous is not a perfect solution to problems faced in crypto tax reporting, it would help Coinbase improve its compliance status by subjecting more users to reporting requirements. Isn't that great? So they fucked up. Uh, to the point where a bunch of people might have overpaid a ton in taxes uh, trying to fulfill their obligations for transactions that weren't labeled correctly. Uh, and the main reason why they might be fixing that now is because they realized, oh, it makes us good. It makes us look good from a compliance standpoint because we're going to be, you know, more data on more people to the IRS. Cool. Fun. Yep, but like, oh my god, I'm I just cringe inside thinking about how much people had to deal with bullshit from the IRS because of money they never made because somebody at Coinbase is an incompetent moron. Yeah, I mean, to give an example from the uh, the the I think whatever is called Crypto Trader dot tax or whatever the service was, um, they actually used a real example in their blog to explain how bad it was and basically this one guy that they didn't name got a letter saying he owed like i think it was two hundred thousand dollars to the irs and it turns out actually the irs owed him two thousand dollars like that is a huge margin of error <laughs> yep maybe people will think twice um as far as what businesses they want to deal with after that yeah, like, seriously, this stuff is, and I think, I mean, probably a lot of people don't even know that when they use these services, that it doesn't matter what they file themselves, that, you know, your KYC, you're, you're, they're collecting information about you, and they're going to be sending it to the IRS themselves regardless. So if you don't do something, you are going to get fucked. And if their information is wrong, then the IRS is going to fuck you instead. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, bad, bad Coinbase, bad, all of you, bad, also IRS for making it so complicated that people can't even figure out which form is the right one to use. I just can't get over this. Like I knew all of the purposes of these forms and could have told them you're fucking up hardcore and i'm just a random jackass who is not a cpa not a tax attorney i just had to figure stuff out running a very small business like the degree of fuck up is that big just jesus christ I believe this is the reason why every time you go and look for these forms on these platforms, they usually have a disclaimer saying you should contact your own tax attorney and not <laughs> not listen to our advice completely. Yep. All right. I guess uh, that wraps up Coinbase Hour. Are we ready for Lightning Hour? Yes. So, Shared Bits, once again, um, knocking shit out of the park, um, have made a proof of concept implementation of point time lock contracts um, based on the Eclair implementation of Lightning using ECDSA adapter signatures. So, this is really fucking awesome. Um, pretty much for anybody who's not familiar with ptlc versus htlc um with a hash time lock contract the receiver just has a pre-image to the hash lock that every single hop in the payment has the same um hash lock on um, the same pre-image for that um so that can be potentially very bad for privacy um ptlc's are pretty much a way of doing the same kind of trip that uh, adapter signatures do, except with actual private keys themselves. So rather than having a single uniform hash lock, um, the receiver generates a value, and then the sender generates um, a series of different values depending on how long the payment route is. And then effectively, um, you just play games, um, mushing these values together 
and passing the aggregate values um, backwards in the path from the receiver side, while the sender um, with select aggregate values pushes them forward. And that way, as the aggregate values from the receiver flow backwards through the, the payment route, um, each hop in the payment is able to generate the specific um, key that they need to settle their HTLC without having each hop have a you know identifiable correlated value tying the contract together and so this is just really fucking awesome to have because even though you know it looks like Schnorr and Taproot are finally gaining some momentum and we might get around to actually activating them sometime soon it's just really nice to see a, a proof of concept that we can implement a more private way to make payments atomic on the Lightning Network, even without Schnorr. So even in worst case, um, Mr. Nikita the moron convinces everybody not to activate Taproot, we will still be able to make this kind of improvement to the Lightning Network that improves its privacy and adds extra barriers to correlating links in a payment route through it. So, you know, once again, fucking Sherdvit's knocking it out of the damn park. I think these guys are one of the most underappreciated companies in the space. Oop. Ready for the cool thing that Lightning Labs made? Yes. So they built an extension to Lightning Loop, um, the submarine swap implementation that lets you atomically swap in and out of a lightning channel to on chain called auto loop and this is a pretty you know nice simplified thing for people who want to run routing nodes but don't want to micromanage things all the time so pretty much the gist is um a channel rule where you set up um a threshold um, percentage wise in how much incoming liquidity and outgoing liquidity you want in the, the channel um, out of the total. And whenever things cross these thresholds, um, pretty much the client will automatically loop funds out of the channel to target a balance in between those thresholds. So let's say you always want 20% of the channel um, liquidity available to route payments out and 40% to route payments in. If things ever cross and unbalance themselves past those thresholds, um, you know, imagine 40% as a line on one side and 20 on the other, the auto loop will loop out enough to kind of put the liquidity balance right between those positions. So it would be something like 60% on one side and 40% on the other. And based on the, the thresholds that you set, it will just automatically loop out to keep your channel balanced um, in that way. And then there's also um, some nice features in terms of dealing with on-chain fees. Um, so you can set your own um, kind of target time for block confirmation to keep fees low. Um, you can have a set limit for the highest fee byte that you will pay so it won't try to loop out if fees um, kind of go above that limit and you can also start a budget for a set period of time um, and pretty much like let's say you want to budget for a month um, a total amount you'll pay on fees um, you set that and after you pass that budget threshold it will no longer um, auto loop out so aside from just a nice automated balance of channel liquidity management, there's, you know, these safety features to make sure that automated behavior doesn't start kicking off constantly and wind up bleeding a lot of revenue and fees. So, you know, I think this is a huge step forward for making lightning node management um, something you don't have to constantly hover over and micromanage. So this is... Nowhere near as cool as Lightning Pool, but I, I'd still say a pretty awesome improvement to things. Ooh. What else? Beep boop. C Lightning has dropped version 0.9.2, um, and as they love to make silly names for releases, um, this one is 
now with zero of n multisig. You know, if you guys remember the huge um, BSV multisig bug that would let you spend stuff with no keys. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this is pretty much um, a couple changes to the RPC. Um, you can now actually list um, all of the state changes in a channel. So for instance, if, if you kind of come back and a channel's closed and you're not sure why, um, it maintains all the different state changes so you can investigate that. Um, there's also for the close channel function, um, something that allows you to kind of see status updates for attempts to close channels. Um, there is now a new um, commitment fee rate function. And um, if you guys don't remember, they a while back added a multi fund channel function so that you can create a PSBT um, that opens multiple channels in a single transaction. The commitment fee rate allows you to set a separate fee um, for the funding transaction and for the individual commitment transactions in channels so that you're not kind of stuck in everything has the same fee commitment as well as a new um, feature to generate an HSM secret um, for their um, HSM tool that can manage keys and signing um, from a BIP39 passphrase. Although they do warn um, that they use a non-standard derivation path. So anything you generate with that will not be um, compatible with any other um, BIP39 software. And then a dump chain descriptors um, so that you can get a master XPUB to watch any on-chain funds in the wallet after they have been swept out of an HTLC or a commitment transaction. So that will not um, show any funds that are kind of in the process of settling on-chain. Um, you, you actually have to sweep them out of those contracts before that XPUB will show balances. And um, what else? Um, a new little... Um, hook call for their plugin system so that you can now specify um, if you have multiple plugins um, the order in which they're run so if you have you know a whole set of plugins that are designed to interact with each other um, you can guarantee that they run in the appropriate order and don't create weird behavior so woo woo i'm waiting to see the first person who takes advantage of the new zero of end feature Mm -hmm. And thus lens or er, lens ends the lightning hour, which I think was a fraction of the Coinbase hour. Yes, much less drama, much less talky. So, what other cool things have appeared? Well, um, as of two days ago, Join Market released version zero point eight point zero, and from now on, the wallet and the order book. Use native SegWit BEC32 addresses for coin joins by default. Um, and this is something that BISC has also been working on, and I believe was included in their latest release 1.5.0 a few days ago. And that's pretty much the update uh, native SegWit in Join Market. And I believe BISC is also native SegWit. They didn't specify it specifically in the release, but I'm pretty sure it's native also. Woo! So I guess we're finally undoing the damage of destroying Bitcoin privacy by having different address types? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I hope Nikita is proud. Well, should we slide along to the next cool things? Yes. So BTC Pay has just dropped 1.0.6.0 and oh my god, stop with the O's. But um they're kind of setting up a lot of massive structural changes with this one. Um, so they've had a lot of friction that new users are getting into as far as registering new stores, um, going through the wallet setup process, the lightning setup process. And so pretty much they're starting to refactor the entire user interface for that to make things a little more uh, smooth. Um, kind of rather than a little bit of a confusing maze of things, just 
a simple flow process that will have little warnings and alerts that things are not, um, you know, completely set up now, which is absolutely awesome to see because this software stack does need to be point and click if we really want to see massive adoption and use of this. Um, they've also, um, due to um, some complaints of people being unable to understand um, the difference between the on-chain and the lightning um, QR code in an invoice, because if you have the, the lightning node set up, it pretty much um, you know, will have a, a single invoice page and the user has to click between on-chain and lightning um, based on what they're paying. So they've extended a, um, a new QR code format that um, will display an on-chain address as well as link to a lightning invoice um, in a single QR code that will suggest paying over lightning um, if a supporting wallet is used. And, you know, hopefully this kind of smooths over the friction there. Um, they've also completely redesigned the um, payment request um, and refund page. So um, for those not familiar with that feature, they have the ability to um, kind of issue a refund by setting up um, just clicking on the invoice that was involved um, and creating a link for that user so that they can click that to try to claim the payment. And then the uh, store operator will get a notification to confirm the refund and actually send that out of the wallet. And they're also looking long-term at automating that so that the merchant would not have to manually approve things. Um, they can just set up the refund. And as soon as the user um, you know, clicks that on the page to claim it, it would just automatically work. Um, also, um, they have a QR code um, designed now for the pay button, which is kind of used to generate new addresses for donations and things like that as well as um, a new warning um, because in the store um, wow well, the store settings page um, merchants are allowed to decide how many confirmations they require on a transaction before an invoice is complete um, and they do allow um, zero comp, but they're now kind of putting up a, a little warning page that this might be uh, dangerous and strongly discourage that. As well as shifting the entire um, API away from the one based on BitPay um, to a new Greenfield API. Um, and they're encouraging new integrations, you know, switch over and use this, but they're going to maintain the BitPay formatted one for a while. And my last little favorite thing here, um, they are building a plugin system, um, kind of similar to C Lightning's plugin setup. And right now this is pretty much entirely experimental and there's no plugins that really work functionally. They're just proof of concepts to build this out, but they are planning on slowly shifting features that are not predominantly used by most users into plugins and then eventually have this uh, plugin um, API set up so that people can just build new features without having to go harass the BTC pay team. Uh, they can just make their plugin users opt in to whichever plugins they want to use and uh, make the entire stack just a lot more you know, extensible and generalized. So yeah, um, BTC pay knocking it out of the park this release. And one small thing that was also included um, at the top of their change log and announcement is that they urge people to update as soon as possible um, because this release includes a patch for a quote, privacy leak vulnerability we discovered and they don't go into any detail, and I haven't seen anyone talk about what this might be as they don't link to a particular issue or pull request or commit in particular that fixed it. So um, I assume we will find out later once enough time has been allowed for people to update their instances. Um, otherwise, you would have to uh, go through all of the commits uh, in this release um, manually and see which ones 
relating to the payment button might uh, have fixed that issue to figure out what it might be. Yep, and I woke up too late this morning to even bother doing that. But, you know, j just to be clear, though, if, if you are not using the pay button feature, um, you should be okay. But if you are, I would um, update ASAP because... You know, a privacy leak um, for a user sending you money is kind of a problem that affects more than just you. Speaking of warnings of issues, though, I think there is another one that is really obnoxious, and I'm betting this is probably going to take a while to get dealt with. Yeah, so uh, another PSA is that um, Samurai Wallet has identified a fake copy of their app in the Google Play Store titled Samurai Bitcoin Wallet version 2.0, um, which obviously is not matching at all, and it claims to have over 500 downloads, which is nothing compared to the real Samurai Wallet's over 100,000 downloads, um, but you should always go to their website first anyway if you're unsure if you're looking at the real thing. And uh, I actually, because this was um, brought up a few days ago, and I don't even know if the fake one is still available. Um, I mean, I don't have a phone, but you can visit the Google Play Store um, from, you know, a desktop or laptop as well. And I was unable to find this app today when I checked, so it might have already been reported to death. Um, I don't know if, it, so it might have already been taken down, but if you see something like that, you should definitely uh, notice the title being weird and uh, the fact that it doesn't match the link, the ID doesn't match the link at all on Samurai's website, so be aware of that. Yeah, that's definitely something people should call out the instant they see it. I mean, you know, 500 downloads isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things um, compared to Samurai's user base, but that's still 500 people who potentially just lost a bunch of their money. Yeah, I mean, it, it, with this kind of stuff, it's hard to tell because those, I mean, if someone is willing to put up a fake copy of Samurai, maybe, I mean, I don't know if anyone's checked whether it actually, when you install it, whether it actually even looks like Samurai or if it installs something completely different. But um, we have no idea whether those 500 downloads are actual people who downloaded it by mistake or if those are downloads that they generated. Like, you know, there's these bot farms and stuff. There's plenty of videos where they, I mean, most of that, they do that for click farms. But I'm sure someone could figure out some cheap or relatively cheap way in comparison to what they think they could get by doing this um, of setting up a bunch of phones that just download the app. So... Yeah. Scammer's going to scam. But this is why, I mean, I think, I mean, that's why the number of downloads marker, um, I mean, that can be useful. But then if, like, if you go to an app and you don't, if you've never seen the real one before, then saying that the app has 500 downloads, you think, oh, well, that's impressive. That means 500 people downloaded it. But as a metric, it's kind of useless because you have no idea whether those downloads are real or not. So the real marker is looking at uh you know the website for the project looking at the developer profile that it's labeled under especially if they have you know signatures and a history of releases that show up in the history so uh there's like tons of things you should look at instead of number of downloads because basically that was i mean other than using the logo and part of the name this did not look like a real samurai app at all Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Are we ready for moving to the next thing? Yes. So the cold card has dropped a new beta version of firmware. And I think that, um, you know, this might actually be the first time they've done that. I can't recall um, any beta releases for firmware from them before. Um, but there are a few minor uh, bug fixes and then two stupid things um, that were incessantly um, bitched about by people from Shift Crypto um, that were added that really presented no real risk at all. Um, so a while back, they posted a comparison of 
um, different hardware wallets and what you can and cannot view on the device. Um, and erroneously claimed that the master X pub was not visible on the cold card. Um, it has been since literally the original version. Um, but went on to continue complaining that it would not show the Y pub or Z pub for, um, pay to witness script or pay to witness script hash, um, addresses. So these are now available, um, along with the master X pub. Um, also, um, recently, um, they have complained that, um, test net functions on the cold card are a security risk. Um, if everybody remembers, uh, maybe a month or two ago, we covered an issue with numerous other wallets that supported um, different forks of Bitcoin that because they use the same keys, um, you could actually maliciously trick a user into signing, um, say, a Bitcoin cash transaction, but actually signing um, Bitcoin transactions on the mainnet. And they're, they're screaming that this potential um, issue existing with the cold card regarding testnet addresses is the same major security risk. Um, despite the fact that there is really no reason for anybody but a developer to be poking around with testnet mode on that, um, I've never even done that. And I like to poke and play with a lot of the things I get. Um, but anyway, um, despite this not really being a, an issue that most people have to worry about, they've buried the test net mode even deeper in the settings in the danger zone section of the menu where all the advanced features are and added a warning for users, um, you know, to be wary if somebody is telling you to turn test net on and fuck with this, that, you know, they might be trying to scam you. And lastly, drum roll excitement. They have added support for PayJoin PSBT signing based on the BIP78 spec. So, woo! Um, let's start trying to push more people to support that because that offers some pretty interesting, um, you know, things you could do in terms of withdrawing coins from places or services and depositing them into cold storage that might be interesting to think about or play with but yeah just remember 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 this is a beta release so don't go take your cold storage or your main wallet and update to this to play around with things um you know maybe wait until the final version of this drops but if you have other devices that you can tinker around with have at it mm-hmm so is it time to make funny shit coiners? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I just think uh, it's an interesting little tidbit of uh, info. Then I get to make funny shit coiners, right? You can make funny shit coiners whenever you want to. Well, what is the fun tidbit of info? Well, uh, Mike Novogratz spilled some beans uh, about the early Ethereum days on a cryptocurrency-focused YouTube channel called Nuggets News. Great name. Um, as summarized by Decrypt, he said that he met up with college roommate Joseph Lubin to discuss purchasing a 25% stake in his venture studio, Consensus. The firm, incidentally, also funds an editorially independent Decrypt, and this article is in Decrypt. Uh, I find that uh, distinction that they made there kind of funny. Like, yes, we are funded by a uh, Ethereum billionaire or something. Is he still a billionaire? I haven't checked lately. But anyway, Novogratz was inspired by Lubin's belief in Ethereum. He was sold on the, uh, the idea that it could be used to disrupt a variety of industries. But when buying a stake in consensus, uh, or when buying a stake in consensus became more complicated than Novogratz initially thought, I wonder why that is, he figured he should at least buy some Ethereum. And I'm also, like, you'd think that the news outlet that is literally funded by one of the founders of Ethereum would get it right and not say some Ethereum. They would say Ether, you know, the actual name of the, the, the coin, but I guess not. They make that mistake several times and it's kind of hilarious. Like, 
<laughs> all all the money that you could uh all the money in the world can't buy um yeah uh, accurate journalism i guess and so yeah he says i was at least intelligent enough to say that i'm not leaving until i buy some of the ethers he said at the time ethereum was tricky to buy since few exchanges particularly in the u.s supported it it was trading at around 95 cents at the time Novogratz said i called him ethereum founder co-founder vitalik buterin up i had sent him uh, i sent him i had met him once at a dinner he remembered me but didn't know me he thought it was good for the community to have a Wall Street guy buying, so I bought half a million Ether at 99 cents, maybe. 99 or 98 cents. He changed the price on me at the last minute from 98 to 99 because I had waited too long and the price went up. And so then Decrypt notes, in late 2015, Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin sold half a million Ethereum, again, with the incorrect terms uh to galaxy digital ceo mike novogratz in an over-the-counter transaction he sold each eth for just 99 cents today that nest egg would have been worth 229 million dollars so yeah you know in case anyone uh, was under the illusion that the early ethereum days were not just a uh you're in it or you're not club where people were patting their college roommates on the back and stuff we so Vitalik um, scammed the shit out of things. Um, you know, accumulated a bunch of Bitcoin from stuff, a bunch of free ETH, cashed some of that free ETH out um, for cash under the table, and then I uh, wow, that's that's probably totally not the same kind of stuff happening now. I'm sure everybody magically found like their ethical compass and and stopped doing greasy things like that. Not. Yeah, I, I love how they frame this as, oh, Vitalik sold him a bunch of ether and it's worth a lot more now, and they don't really point out the fact, like, Vitalik made a bunch of money on a token that he created, <laughs> and, you know, it's just 500000 now it's $229 million. like, lost out. It's like, really? Yep. I have not even seen that much money in my entire life, let alone sent it in a single transaction to a guy i just met welcome to the scammies but uh what other scammy stuff is being investigated well um so a bunch of details have finally come out regarding the plus token um shenanigans in china as well as the people who have been arrested um assets that were seized and so on uh so pretty much 15 people have been convicted and i want to kind of caveat here that um all of the the rulings that have come out are in mandarin and i pretty much just google translated that so keep that in mind in terms of little weird subtle things that might have not come out uh quite so accurately in the translation but it looks like um pretty much between the 15 of them this two to 11 years um in jail so far with uh numerous varying fines generally correlating with how long they've been sentenced to and um yeah around 200,000 BTC were seized um 833 um ETH 1.4 million Litecoin 27 million EOS 74,000 Dash 487 million XRP 6 billion Doge uh, 80,000 BCH and around $213,000 of UST or USDT were seized. And pretty much, um, according to, uh, Molly, um, a Chinese lady formerly from Bitcoin magazine, um, the Chinese government has been slowly selling these for a while in partnership with a platform. And it's her speculation that they probably sold most of this um, already. Although, um, I could see the potential of them still having some, but I hope she's right here because I would really not like China to have a giant pile of Bitcoin like that. But, um, you know, looking at the actual um, verdict and sentencing, 
I, I really think that this just reinforces a lot of my interpretation uh, of this event based on the OXT chain analysis and the initial arrests. Um, I really don't think that most of what got these people arrested it has anything to do with chain analytics. Um, a large part of the uh, the document that I read was citing like you know sports cars, um, massive pieces of property, large amounts of money um, being deposited into banks and people's names, um, and all of these people or most of them were publicly involved in advocating for plus token um they were doing so with their face under their name um none of this was hidden in the shadows so it th this really does confirm in my mind that almost everything that got them busted was just cashing things out into kyc um exchanges fiat and then buying a bunch of property and like, frankly, if you're going to run a Ponzi scheme that's going to suck in billions of dollars, maybe you shouldn't cash that money out into institutions like that in your name and start buying up a bunch of flashy property. Governments tend to notice things like that. So, yeah, um, though those are the, the high level details and the gist of it. And let's hope that the CCP actually sold and is selling all of this because I really don't want to see a world where the Chinese government has almost 200,000 Bitcoin at their disposal. Yeah. But I guess that wraps it up with a bow for the day. What do we got for final thoughts? Well, uh, in addition to the uh, questionable comments from Michael Sayer, Sailor that we heard and talked about in the last episode, we've had more questionable comments. Yes, Sailor, Sailor Boy. Um, we've had more questionable comments from some guy named Raul Pal, who I literally, I, I really haven't heard of him before this point, so I don't know why he's significant. But very, apparently, very well known um, legacy investor who has done very well for himself. Okay, well, good for him. Not legacy enough for me, apparently. Um, yeah, so he's been making some comments too and saying if you think that secrecy from governments and no KYC is Bitcoin's future, then you don't understand what adoption looks like. They will regulate it. You will declare it. You will have to do KYC, and that is fine. It doesn't take away its store of value, but just integrates it. And it's like, oh, Jesus, this argument about, oh, adoption and privacy are opposed to each other is just fucking bullshit. We've heard it so many times. We've heard it from stuff that has nothing to do with Bitcoin or even cryptocurrency. Um, as uh, Aaron Verdum indicated, you should just go read the damn Cypherpunk manifesto because what you're saying has been said before and I am bored of it and my answer to this implication that you must give up privacy in order to have and use money is no. Goodbye. Go away. I don't care how much money you have. You're a dumb shit. Yeah. This this is what has really bothered me about the circle jerking of all the big hedge fund guys and traders and investors when they come into this space is like all right, you know, some part of me is happy, more liquidity, number go up, I have more value. But like, did everybody really think that this class of people coming into Bitcoin would give two shits about the political activism that a lot of us are here for? Of course they don't. They don't give a flying fuck. They just want a chunk of the very scarce asset so that their wealth does not evaporate. They don't give a flying fuck about government abuses. They don't give a flying fuck about privacy. They, they don't care about these things. So, you know, yeah, sit and think for a minute. What are you actually here for? Because when I see circle jerking over people like this, Every time they step in the door, I see somebody who doesn't give a shit about anything but number go up. And when I see people virtue signaling about privacy, about 
activism and then immediately offering guys like that a hand job when they come in the door, go fuck yourself. You're full of shit. You're just here for number go up. I don't see a man. All I see is someone who's surrendered to the man. And I say no. <laughs> but I do. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think the reason that guys like this keep saying this is because, I don't know, maybe a part of them actually wants to have some semblance of privacy that they gave up a long time ago but they're in so they're so in deep now to these systems that don't have it that they want to deny it to everyone else so that they don't look like idiots when you know governments may start cracking down on people and they may get scrutinized so i guess yeah my my cat is very upset as you can tell she does not like this commentary whatsoever about privacy um i believe there was an article that ragnar shared recently about um trying to stay in the circular economy mm -hmm. and that's yeah that that's going to be the case like there's more and more talk about there being like two two different bitcoins there's coins that people are actually sending to each other and holding themselves and mixing themselves and they won't give a shit what you know the custodial exchange uh sellouts like these guys are doing um they can both happen at the same time there's <laughs> is you don't you don't have to you don't have to surrender like these guys have like they have a lot of money but they have no freedom because that is a choice that has very little to do with money. Yep. Well, I guess, I don't know. Let, let's round this off here. Uh, fuck Michael Saylor. Uh, fuck Raul Paul. Um, stop giving them hand jobs. On that note, hope you enjoyed the show. Catch you later, punks. Bye. <laughs> Was there, was there, that's a good chance to